Hello Sigma Males and welcome back to the channel. So I am actually pretty tired today and I don't really have any energy to make up some new cringe 4chan joke. So as a result, I am just going to go get right into the video. I should mention that I will be posting the banger of the century this Sunday. So do prepare yourselves to repost that to blind and uh, watch it with an audience. Anyways, let's get into this thing. We've got to talk about consistent hashing. Okay, so I'm going to start off this video by basically talking about partitioning rebalancing and just kind of one general schema that naively we might use to partition some of our keys. So let's imagine we have got a bunch of different keys, you know, like Jordan, Corinna, Kate, and we want to be able to go ahead and shard those to a bunch of different nodes. So naively, you might do something like this. Well, what we would say is we would take a hash of a key, and since we've got four partition nodes, as shown below, we are going to take modulus of four and then put it in the node corresponding to that. So let's imagine the first key is 16, and then you know that goes to node zero, because 16 divided by four is, you know, take the modulus of that, so zero. Same thing with 28, and then we've also got 12 and 19 also shown on the screen. But what if we were to change things up a little bit because I were to go ahead and nuke node three. And so now instead of being hash of key mod four, we do hash of key mod three. So now all of a sudden, where is 16 going? 16 is going to node one, 28 divided by three, also actually going to go to node one, 12 divided by three, going to node zero, and then 19 mod three is also going to be going to node one. So all of a sudden, as you can see, we've just had to move around a ton of our keys and basically just move around a ton of the data by using this modulus function. And so I guess the general opening point of this video is if we are trying to partition keys in a way that is easy to kind of rebalance them when we add new nodes or remove nodes from the cluster, we certainly should not be doing this mod n partitioning, right? It is not efficient because what that results in is whenever the cluster basically changes in size, we have to send the majority of our keys over the network and that puts an unnecessary strain on our system. So like we said, modulus doesn't work. Well, then what does work? What does work is consistent hashing. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in this video, along with one or two other quick, basically rebalancing schemes that we can do. So what's the point of consistent hashing? Well, consistent hashing is a method of partitioning basically certain values evenly amongst nodes in a way that if the size of our cluster changes, a minimal amount of data is sent from one node to the others. So we'll see what that looks like in a bit, but you know that's generally the point here, which is that we don't wanna be doing too much rebalancing if we can avoid it. And not only is this great for partitioning, but it's also great for load balancing. Load balancing is a topic for another video, but the gist is sometimes we have many application servers and we wanna send requests from our clients to different application servers. And so consistent hashing is also useful for that. Again though, topic for another video. Okay, so let's actually go ahead and demonstrate our algorithm. So the first thing we wanna do is pick out some value k. And I'll explain the significance of k later, but right now let's imagine k equals three. So what does k equal three here mean? It means that on this ring that I've demonstrated down below, for every single partition, we are going to pick three points. We're gonna pick k points. And so what the ring represents is basically our hash range. Remember hash range partitioning? which is basically taking uh, the hash of each key and then sharding it to a node corresponding with a range of that hashing. So as you can see, zero is at the top of the ring, 250 is the right side, 500 at the bottom, 750 on the left. It's effectively a clock. And so for every single one of our partitions, as you can see, we've got partitions one through four, we're gonna pick three points on this ring. So now let's answer a couple of questions. Let's say I'm talking about node three. What keys actually belong in node three? To figure that out, we look at our ring and we say, okay, well, I see a node three point right here, and that is going to contain all of these keys along this part of the circle. So for the sake of this video, let's imagine that's like zero to 100. So those are gonna be in node three, but similarly, we've also got a point over here, which is also in node three, and so this range of keys is going to be in node three, so that's gonna be let's say 200 to 250. 
And then also node three is going to be here as well. And so that is going to be, let's say, I don't know, uh, 700 to 800. And so that's actually going to be the range of hashes of keys that are going to be contained on partition three. And so you see, the reason that we can kind of generalize this out is that for every single one of these nodes, all you have to do is go clockwise until the next node point comes up and you know that range of keys is valid. So again, you know, like for node one, for example, this range of keys will be on node one and you know, so will two others. Okay, so now the point here, is why is consistent hashing so useful? What's so good about it? Well, I said the entire point is not only does it distribute things evenly, but also it is going to basically minimize the amount of things that we have to send over the network when a node is added and deleted. Okay, so let's start with, say, deleting a node. I'm gonna first start by deleting node four. So I'm gonna get rid of this. Oh God, I've really messed up now, haven't I? I'm gonna get rid of this here and get rid of that there get rid of this here, get rid of that there, and get rid of this here. So as you can see, there were a bunch of things that were on node four, right? They were over here and over here, but now those are just gonna be extended into node one, they're gonna be extended into node three, they're gonna be extended into node three again, and you'll see that even though node four was actually removed here, we're not rebalancing any of the data on the other nodes that were not touched. We're just taking node four's data and distributing it in a relatively even manner amongst our other nodes. Let's now go ahead and say I added node four back. So we're gonna add node four back in a bunch of random places. Let's say I add it here, and remember we have to pick three points, I add it back here, and then I will add it over here. So now, instead of basically requiring all of the keys to shift around again, we're only forcing a small portion of the keys to actually be shifted to node four. So now node four is gonna, in this case, it's gonna steal these, uh, or rather it's gonna steal these keys over here from node one. It's also going to basically steal these keys over here from node two. And then finally, it's gonna steal these keys over here from node two. So by using this consistent hashing ring, we can ensure that we're not over rebalancing like we were in the first example. Recall that in the first example, we were taking keys on nodes that weren't even really being touched and we were sending them all over the place. There's no reason to have to do that if we can avoid it. And that is what consistent hashing is accomplishing for us. So another method, or basically an analysis of consistent hashing is that the way we can think of each node is actually having a fixed number of partitions. So in this case, the fixed number of partitions was actually going to be that variable k. So we've got k over here, we set it to three, and k is basically the number of partitions per node. So there are actually some mathematical guarantees about consistent hashing in terms of the distribution of the keys. You're welcome to look them up on Wikipedia. Frankly, I don't think it's really that important for the sake of this video, but it is cool if it's something you're interested in. Okay, so we've discussed now the concept of having a fixed number of partitions per node. But another possible partition rebalancing method that you'll often see is actually just doing a total fixed number of partitions. And that's not per node, but it's per system, right? So like our entire backend has a total fixed number of partitions. So let's imagine in this case that we have 12 partitions. Here's what it would look like if we lose a node. Basically what's gonna happen here is, you know, originally all of these guys start out with four partitions and then once uh, our third node is deleted, we can take A and B and send it to the first guy and take C and D and send it to the second guy. Similarly, another option is that, you know, if we gain a node because all of a sudden we want more partitions, we have a lot of data, we can actually take, you know, A, and B and C and D and you know basically distribute them out evenly. So I, I drew this out wrong, but the point is, as you can see from our fourth node over here, it's going to take the D partition from all three of these guys. So we're going to borrow this, we're gonna borrow this, we're gonna borrow this, and that's what happens when we gain a node. So basically using a fixed number of partitions is very viable in the sense that it's simplistic to think about, right? We know at all times how many partitions there are total, 
and so we can easily assign them from node to node. However, it also does come at a downside, which is that we actually have to choose a pretty good number. So what happens if there are too few partitions? Well, let's say we have I don't know, 10 partitions in our system, but we also have an exabyte of data. Well, that means that every single partition is gonna be an exabyte divided by 10. So I guess 100 petabytes, and you can't fit 100 petabytes of data on one hard drive. So you're basically just taking an L there if you only choose 10. At the same time, if you were to do too many, basically now we have a bunch of overhead on our hard drives of you know, keeping track of what partition means what. So for example, you know, I have to keep track here that partition one is corresponding to the range zero to 72. Here's the same thing with partition two, all the way through partition n. So if we have a bunch of those, you know, this table could in theory take up some extra space on our disk, and we don't really want to be doing that. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to touch upon in this video is the concept of dynamic partitioning. So even though all of these partitioning schemas allow us to rebalance our nodes, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be happening on its own. Oftentimes, there's probably going to be some sort of data center kind of uh, representative or you know person who's really trained in this, making sure that load is getting balanced properly, and if not, making the proper adjustments. That being said, it is possible that the database could actually manage its own rebalancing. However, this does run a risk, which is that if you do it too often, as in, you know, let's say you rebalance when you don't necessarily need to, the nodes are just fine, but you know, maybe you accidentally think one is down. Well, then all of a sudden we start sending a bunch of rows of our data over the network and we don't need to, and we're actually putting a greater cost on our system in order to do that. And so I guess the question then kind of becomes, well, how do we even know when our system is down? How can we agree upon this type of thing? And of course, what do we do about it? Well, it's not so easy to know when a system is down. And frankly, this type of video begs many, many others. And of course, that's what we'll be doing next. So look forward to distributed consensus, guys, because that's what's next on our plate. Anyways, have a great night, everyone. I am going to pass out. And uh, yeah, enjoy yourselves.